The first rule of planning aesthetic dentistry is so key that everything about the smile just falls into place from this very first rule. Well, I've got Dr. Josh Valley today to share the four rules of planning aesthetic dentistry. Hello, Patrice Rati. I'm Jazz Glati, and welcome back to your favorite dental podcast. It's been a crazy few weeks for Team Protrusive. Just a few weeks ago, we hosted Lincoln Harris live in London for his famous de stress dental lecture. And let me tell you, this was a masterclass in theatrics, comedy, dental comedy, and public speaking. It was just a phenomenal lecture. And I've actually got his slides uh, on my desktop. And for eight hours, he spoke for seven hours, right? And he only had like 38 slides. Like, this is a sign of a phenomenal speaker. Like he barely looked at his slides. He has so much conviction in his message and the lessons he shared were so real world. A lot of big, bigger picture communication type stuff to reduce our stress and dentistry and a few slides here and there and then delving deeper into it. It was just such an engaging lecture. There's very few people I think can hold and captivate an audience for six hours during the day and you learn so much at the same time. It's just absolutely brilliant. So hats off to you, Link, for, for that. And I met so many of you for the first time. It was great to connect with the producer uh, Safina came all the way from Northern Ireland. She's a dental student. It was great that you made that trip. She's part of our Telegram group. So Safina, a personal thank you for, for coming all that way on a day where there were so many train strikes from around the UK. So thank you so much. And a shout out. I mean, I don't want, I can't shout out all of you. There's like so many I met for the first time. It was such a privilege. But I'm going to shout out Saga Patel. Uh, Saga is someone who told me a story when he met me. He said that the influence that Protrusive had on him was so big. And the Protrusive Dental Community Facebook group helped him to connect with his now principal and he's in a good place he's in a happy environment and that just made me feel so warm and fuzzy and happy and in fact we've been uh, connecting and exchanging messages on Facebook and uh, we have this photo that we took together and he said mate I owe my whole inspiration of dentistry back to you became very demotivated during COVID and DCT but your passion kept me going to where I am now so this was just a, a, an amazing thing to hear from a producer like him. And these messages really keep me going. And so many of you came with love and kindness. So thank you to all the people who came to my event. Uh, and it was just lovely to see you all. The Protrusive Dental Pearl is actually a, a snippet from that lecture that I'm going to share with you. I'm going to paraphrase for you. So Lincoln, if you haven't heard of Lincoln's episodes, go back, find anything by Lincoln Harris, talk about retraction cords recently, and also an episode for dental students, just absolutely phenomenal. Also, if you go back many episodes, there was five rules uh, that I've learned from Lincoln Harris, which are just so fundamental. So these are really key episodes that you should go back and listen to when you get a chance. But the pearl I want to share for you is from that lecture. And basically, it's when you've presented some complex or comprehensive dentistry to a patient and they are not quite sure. You know, sometimes even if it's just like the one main option to treat them and they're not sure, or maybe they're deciding between, you know, composites or ceramics and they're not sure, or just any hint of them being uncertain anyway, then the advice that Link gave, which I just love, and I really want to just share this with you all now for those who weren't there at the lecture. If you have such a patient, you should say to them, I won't let you make a decision yet because you're not sure or not motivated. Obviously, they might not be motivated. Like for example, dentistry is a stress purchase. It's like sometimes when I have to get my tires replaced, I don't have to do that. Patients come in, they don't want to have crowns. They we're recommending crowns because their teeth are in a bad state. So we, they need crowns on the posterior teeth, for example. For This is a distressing purchase for many patients. So they don't want to have the crowns. So naturally, they don't want to do anything about it. But they're kind of forced to do something about it. So what I would say to you and what, what Lincoln really echoed is that if your patient really isn't motivated for dental treatment, then you shouldn't do that. And I think holds really true for elective work and comprehensive work. If your patient is not sure or they're not motivated for dental treatment, you should not continue to treat them. It just makes sense. Don't do complex treatment on someone who is not sure or not motivated. And it's totally okay to say that to your patient that, look, I don't think you're 100% motivated. When you are motivated and you're feeling ready, we can continue with this. And then they can get their ass in gear and then be motivated for the treatment or justify that treatment to themselves and understand that there is a, an end goal that you're trying to reach. And then that's a much better scenario for you and the patient working together because dentistry is a marriage to your patient, especially with elective and, and comprehensive work. So if your patient is unsure how to proceed, then help them, but don't let them proceed until they are sure and they are motivated. 
Before we join the main episode, I want to shout out to three people who not only joined Protrusive Premium by downloading the app and subscribing, uh, they're the first ones to actually comment on the community tab within the app. So if you haven't already downloaded the Protrusive app on iOS or Android, it's a free app to download. You can even download all the episodes offline so you can listen to them later on the app. If you go premium, then you get some extra benefits. But even if you just joined as a free member, I would love to have you on the app. And for the first three ones that joined were April, Sunny, and Nani. Thank you so much for joining. And, and commenting on the community section and introducing yourselves. It's so great to have you. And, and so thank you so much for, for supporting Protrusive. It really means a lot. And thank you to everyone who's downloaded the app. I hope to grow it and add very regular exclusive content on there. So like I said, if you haven't already downloaded the app on your device, go to iOS, go to Android, just type in Protrusive and download the app. Now let's join the four rules of planning aesthetic dentistry with Dr. Josh Rowley. Josh Rowley, welcome to the Protrusive Dental Podcast, my friend. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Jess. Thanks for having me on. It's an absolute privilege and a pleasure to have you on, uh, Josh. You, I've seen you grow and grow as a clinician. The stuff you're doing in author restorative is amazing. I don't know if you remember a few years ago, I asked you for some help with a case and you helped me nail it. Do you, do you yeah. remember that? I, uh, yeah, I so there we are. I do remember that, yeah. <laughs> Try my best. Yeah. Josh, when I asked you uh, for help on, on, on that case on Facebook all those years ago, so thank you again. Right. I feel like you've switched aligner companies. Uh, you're, you're batting for the other team now. So what, what, <laughs> what, what led you to, to change uh, aligner sort of uh, modality from one company to another company? Because I see you doing a lot of work with, with Short Smile now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I teach and I mentor anyone who needs help with any aligner brands that are out there. But the main reason for me why I, I made the switch a few years ago now to Sure Smile was because of patient preference. You know, patients want a discrete nature treatment, one that maybe their friends, even relatives might not even know that they're they're even doing. And yeah, it, it really does comes down to the, the material that they're made from, actually. Um, I had a friend, actually, who I'm doing his treatment for, who just finished his, his braces treatment. And there's a couple of little tweaks to do. And we have now just made him a couple of sure smile aligners just to finish his case, uh, I suppose, just to do the fine tuning. And he was like, wow, why didn't, <laughs> why didn't I start with these aligners in the first place? He's, and he's a dentist as well. He's a dentist and a colleague of mine. And he's honestly converted. And, and I'm, I'm gradually getting one by one people turning over thinking, why are people not using these? Um, but yeah, the, the clarity is one, the, the, the ability to be able to give the patients what they've asked for, which is a discreet nature treatment. Something that fits in with their lifestyle, something that they can eat and chew what they want. You know, it maintains its clarity throughout the treatment as well. You know, one of the things which was a bit of a bugbear for me was after some aligners have been worn for a few days or a week or so, um, they do tend to tarnish. Uh, and then it makes it a little bit difficult if you have to go back a couple of aligners to kind of pick teeth up and then go forward again. And so it's, it's again opened up a whole new arm of aligner treatment for me where I can ask the patients to go back in time as well as go forward. So um, because they're happy to go back and wear them because they maintain their integrity. Well, I, I think uh, we're going to talk about, uh, I, I mean, I'd like to know a bit more about the that system because there's a, something about trim heights and stuff which uh, yeah. seems really like voodoo science but it seems really clever but i want to <laughs> yeah. i want to save that towards the end uh, let's talk more about the the, the the four principles that make the four rules of aesthetic uh, planning which obviously with your background and author restorative i think you'd be yeah. perfect for and, uh, just to set the scene and context the first time we met was a part of a dental tubal strip to leuven to see to see the gc group we learned about genial composites uh, and mm-hmm. from then i knew okay this guy's a really switched on guy he knows what he wants and to see the dent you've made in the author restorative world has been absolutely amazing so uh, it's, it's great to have you on Josh for those that much. don't know you Josh please tell us a little bit about you your journey how you fell into orthodontics and I actually want to know for myself are you limited to orthodontics because I just feel like that's, that'd be a real shame if you're not doing restorative dentistry as well, well how long have we got <laughs> <My story's been laughs> you've got 60 yeah. seconds for this intro <laughs> oh, 60 seconds well my name is Dr. Josh Rowley. I'm a specialist orthodontist in Edinburgh in Scotland. I work in two dental practices, one which is purely focused at the orthodontics. I do a combination of NHS and private orthodontics. And the other practice is very much a general practice. I, I see patients for checkups. I do restorative work, limited restorative work. I, I tend to not do that many endodontic treatments or nothing with too much blood and guts, no surgery kind of thing. Typical orthodontist. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've been doing a lot of teaching as well, just pretty much since lockdown, actually. I've been quite enjoying that. Uh, Just kind of sharing the past experiences, sharing the knowledge that I can, trying to help younger dentists and dentists that want to get into orthodontics later on in their career, just to try not make the mistakes that I made as such, trying to get them the, the quicker path. (laughs) <laughs> I suppose. Um, but yeah, no, thoroughly enjoying what I do. Couldn't imagine myself doing anything else. 
Well, I, I would have thought when I saw you all those years ago that you were going to be fully down the restorative path. So what, what made you pivot into specializing in orthodontics, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I kind of went a little bit of a, a niche way into orthodontics, whereby I was working in a, a quite a high-end practice in Edinburgh at the time, um, had very good mentors around me. Um, and as a general practitioner, I was doing a lot of aligner treatments. And I really enjoyed doing it, but I definitely found that there was that little black box of knowledge that I just didn't know. And I thought about doing postgraduate courses, privately funded. I then looked into maybe going back and doing specialty training. And it was because I then you know, went into the hospital and just inquired about it that actually it was just a complete chance that at the time the consultant in charge uh, actually offered me a position the following year, in fact, starting in about two months. And, wow. and so, uh, yeah, it was really quite a curveball. Uh, and it, it wasn't a specialist training rate, I have to say. It was a privately funded uh, doctorate whereby um, I entered into uh, the world of orthodontics just wanting to know more. I didn't have any interest really becoming a specialist. I just knew that if I want to know what's inside this box, I've got to go and, and do this, got to treat the patients, bit of over-the-shoulder uh, mentoring. And, and yeah, and it, it kind of went on from there, really. And like I said, it's I, I've got an engineering kind of brain, and orthodontics is all about the kind of the engineering and, and the planning and the cases, which I'm sure we'll talk a lot about today. <laughs> well, I, you know, the education that you do, and I, and I watch your stuff, so I know that you're involved in planning smiles, and uh, yeah. you don't work with DSD, and you, yeah. you, you, you do all that kind of stuff, which is great. So do you still do, like, um, composite bonding, veneers, as an adjunct to your ortho? Or what? give me a percentage yeah. breakdown. Like, I would like to know what Josh Rowley is doing today. So in terms of <laughs> your percentage of aligners, your percentage yeah. of fixed appliances, is for also so tell me about that and then then also tell me ortho in general versus your restorative i i would just just okay. i'm being nosy yeah that's absolutely fine and um, so i would say in both practices now I'm, I'm 50 50 with braces and aligners and the reason why that number might be higher than you might think with braces is because i do nhs orthodontics and mm -hmm. and, and, and nhs orthodontics is really the bread and butter of an orthodontist work it's the growing individuals it's where you can really, you know, do your see the see the biggest changes sometimes, I suppose, with with uh, with functional appliances, even surgery um, as well. Um, but yes, the NHS side leads into the private side in the sense that you'll get a lot of kids whose whose parents uh, might ask, oh, you know, I, I see, uh, I, you know, the results I've seen with with my son or daughter are fantastic. You know, what do you think? Uh, you could do with me and they're sitting in the chair you know just beside the dental chair and they just go like this you know what can you do with this you know i'm sure you get the same <laughs> i know yes. and, and one leads to the other i'm doing more and more treatments with aligners now because i'm becoming more confident in what they can do but i'm very aware of the limitations that aligners have as well and so as i'll probably talk a little bit about later um, aligners are really a, a tool for the job just like braces mm -hmm. are a tool uh, and really it's about knowing the limitations and knowing what is, is best for the job really but in terms of orthorestorative, you're absolutely right. I, I tend to focus my restorative work on the post-orthodontic kind of treatments, like incisal edge bonding, could even be veneers. I'm putting together a, a lecture for a, a course I'm doing next week where, uh, you know, I, I'm, you know what it's like when you're writing lectures, you're trifling through your, your cases, and I'm thinking, yeah, I, I do a lot more porcelain than I maybe think, <laughs> actually. But a lot of it is just the, the tweaking at the end, reshaping the teeth incisally. Um, to turn a, a, a good case into a great one, really. So this episode, what I want to um, extract from your mind onto Petrusrati is where do you even begin? So the rules of aesthetic planning, and who better than you, someone who is you know has done all your training in ortho, formal training ortho, but I know your heart is as a restorative dentist. So I think someone like you is perfectly suited. Now, before we cover the main thing, yep. you know what I'm like when it comes to occlusion. I, I can't, I can't possibly <laughs> continue without asking you a very interesting curveball question. This is completely okay. unscripted uh, for everyone. I was at a lecture yesterday by Corey Ferran and Moira Wong, uh, and they were talking okay. about yeah. the orthodontic restorative interface in terms of the joint position. And uh, what I mean by that is uh, the, the starting point for most rehabs in, in traditional sort of school thinking, not neuromuscular, mm -hmm. but uh, central relation. But then yep. um, Corey asked the audience, okay, now orthodontists, where do they start? Which joint position do they start in? And everyone yep. sort of said, well, they just kind of just work around MIP usually because <laughs> that's what I'm taught. Now for you, as someone who yep. is trained in, you know, as a restorative dentist, I would, I'm just being nosy again. Do you screen for the first point of contact in, in your, your young kids or your, or your adults and then plan from that joint position for your orthodontics? Yeah, absolutely. You know, a leaf gauge is one of the most useful tools in the armory of a dentist, in my opinion. So you want to make sure that the, the patient is comfortable in reaching a CR position. 
And really, you know, that leaf gauge should be a, a diagnostic tool. It's a way of us deciding, is this joint healthy enough to be able to kind of like Humpty Dumpty push this patient off the wall to then put them back together again with mm -hmm. orthodontics? Or, you know, is the joint maybe in a position that's going to cause problems or cause potential pain when you're doing this as well? So for a lot of adult patients, certainly, if there are symptoms of TMD, uh, whether that be muscular or intercapsular problems, it's always good to diagnose those first. And it can be as simple as making a B-splint or a little Lucia jig just to get them to wear for the interim time before they get their braces on or a liner started. And as a general rule of thumb for me, if that pain or problems they've been having go away with that uh, anterior bite or deprogrammer, then you're good to go. Whereas if they sometimes make the problem worse or they really can't wear it, it might be an indication for further diagnostic records. It could even be you would refer them to oral medicine clinic just to see for a second opinion as well. I have to say it's not an area that I'm, you know, a specialist in, not like yourself, but certainly I know the, the boxes to tick to know when I'm being safe or not. <laughs> good man, good man. It's good to hear about orthodontists as yourself looking at the joint position in terms of their final orthodontic outcome. But anyway, that's digressing into occlusion. Where do you start, <laughs> so Josh? Okay, you, you, you got a patient in the chair and they want a, a lovely smile. And with your eyes, how do you begin planning aesthetics? So if you were to boil it down to four rules, which I kindly ask you to do, what yep. is the first rule of, of, of making this, helping this patient to achieve a beautiful smile? Cool. Well, we're off. The four <laughs> rules of planning aesthetic dentistry, in my opinion, the first really, it all starts with the face because you got to know, you know, where, what's going to look good for the patient or where, what is the face asking of the teeth is what, is what we normally say. So first of it all starts with a, a facial photograph and then we start what we would do as a smile design. And so the, the real starting position of a smile is really the incisal edge of the upper central incisors. So we're taking our photograph. The first bit that you do when you're doing a small design is you orientate that photograph to the horizontal. So you're making sure that patient's face is perfectly in line. And then we, we draw- Do you use any up. tools for this? Like, like you know, so yeah, sometimes absolutely. people do like go a bit lopsided. So uh, do you use like blinds behind you? Exactly. So how do you gauge that as a, as a young dentist starting to take photos, portrait photographs? How can yeah. you be sure to help you? So usually natural head position, just asking the patient just to relax, shrug their shoulders usually just before they take the photographs try and get the patient to look directly into the camera and just being aware when the patient might kind of just move their head left to right. So we're getting a really nice parallel picture of the patient's face. The software that I, I would use is just Keynote. You can use Keynote, you can use PowerPoint, you can use Paint, you know, any, any software that allowed you to draw lines on a page. It's really not that simple. You could even print off a picture of the patient's face, a uh, full smiling picture, for example, and, and literally draw with pen and paper. And really you're looking at drawing that midline. Where is the facial midline? And then we're looking at two photographs that I take uh, for every single patient that walks in the door. And that is an M position photograph and an E position photograph. E position being the maximum smile that that patient can give you. You know, really exaggerating the lip movements. You want to see how high that lip moves up or the top lip moves up, I should say. M position, a bit more difficult actually, but that is generally a relaxed position where there is no muscle activity in the upper lip. And what we're really looking for with between these two photographs is where does the incisor lead sit? So the end position, you were looking at maybe two to three millimeters of incisal display in maybe a slightly older patient, whereas that number would usually increase to maybe six or even seven millimeters for someone who's very young. And so really that's our starting point. So the end position- Just, just, just so I can make it, yeah, I think you're gonna to come to it now, exactly what the dentist should say to yeah. the patient to get them to make those um, smiles that we want. Well, to be honest, I just get the patient to lick their lips. So for the end position, I say, lick your lips and just let your lips just rest. And, and a lot of the time for adult patients, you know, they might not show any inside or display at rest. And don't worry if that's the case, because that means you've probably got an additive case where you want to move the teeth down or maybe add length to teeth so they then have display of incisal uh, display at rest. And then with the E position, it is literally just, imagine I've told you the funniest joke and you've got this belly laugh. How high can you get your upper lip to go up when you're smiling at your maximum? Mm -hmm. And that's really what I say. And, and, and it's important to get the diagnosis right because I do get, you know, uh, shy individuals that come in and they're, they're guarded. You know, you want to try and get this E and M position out of them and you got to try and make them laugh anything you can because you can get your diagnosis wrong if you get these photographs wrong. And it's important that you kind mm -hmm. of are aware that that is as much as the lip can move. When I used to, Josh, uh, get my patients to do the, the M, Emma, say, say Emma, yeah. but I found out that people, for some reason, found it funny to say Emma. And then, and then yeah, um, I, I take it, they, they start smiling. So I got, I got, kind of got a little bit of a rest one, but then I got a smile. And then, then my usual question is, do, do you have an Emma in your life? And then 
they really smile, okay? Espe they, 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 they stop um, getting really awkward if their partner's also in the room. <laughs> so I stopped doing that one. <laughs> so I like your one, licking yeah. lips. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Exactly, exactly. And, Very good. And, yeah, and then from there, you know you've got your vertical reference point. You've also got your horizontal reference point because you know where the facial midline is. And that is where you build your smile from that kind of mid dot all the way around mm -hmm. to the back. And I suppose going back a little bit to, to the, the main title, which was the four uh, rules of planning, you know, the next one for me is really getting the diagnosis right. You know, without the diagnosis being correct, you're off to a bad start. It, you know, you might not be able to deliver the best for that patient. And so really just understanding where the patient has come from. Uh, when I when I teach certainly, uh, you know, younger dentists, you know, you know what, what questions they should be asking of the patient. I always start with the, the five W's and, a, and an H. So it's kind of like the what, where, when, why, and, and, and how, or, or who sometimes as well. And it's really asking, you know, where does the patient come from? Why is there where seen here? Asking yourself all these questions, like if you were in like a job interview or something like that, you know. And it's kind of really just getting a detailed background of why the patient is presenting in this way. Because it's only under, once you understand, you know, why their teeth and dentition or malocclusion is like this, you can then start to treat it. So really important that we get the diagnosis right. And that just covers all dentistry, not necessarily just aesthetic dentistry, because aesthetic dentistry really is an umbrella term for all the specialties, really. Okay. I guess the best example of that, Josh, I'm sure you agree, is um, when deciding whether to lengthen the teeth Mm -hmm. like downwards or push the gum go go upwards i.e. crown yeah. lengthening and that's as a young dentist I, I, I used to struggle okay in this case but it's all it comes down to the diagnosis and, and then again your photos just like the ones you described become so yeah. powerful in oh, helping yeah. you decide should you lengthen or actually this is one for the periodontist or yourself with some experience to actually yeah. make the gums go higher up a gum lift that's it yeah you can I mean it, what a smell design is it's basically a blueprint it's like if you're building a house you don't just start laying bricks and that's where dentists go wrong sometimes you got to know where you're going and so therefore what do you do well you bring in an architect you work out what shape what room size where's the garage going and then you know after that then you ask the engineer you know is this actually going to work and what i mean by the engineer in dentistry is you do trial smiles you you might simulate the orthodontic tooth movement with orthodontic uh, simulations and only once you've actually got that you've got your blueprint you've asked the engineer they're pretty happy with it then you start building the bricks and I always say that smile design should really be part of every special diagnosis, just like taking your x-rays or taking uh, photographs. Um, you know, it should form part of your special investigation, sorry, is what I meant to say. And then I suppose going on to, to the third and, kind and of... Be rule. Before we get to the third one, Josh, you know, you made me think of this question now is... You know, you're someone who I respect as a restorative dentist and then you went through this formal orthodontic training, which is awesome. But when you did that orthodontic training, uh, mm -hmm. compared to perhaps some of the other trainees in orthodontics, you were probably a bit more experienced in the restorative side. Mm -hmm. Did you find that the orthodontic program covered these aspects of smile design mm -hmm. in the same or different or better or worse way than what the restorative dentists teach restorative dentists? That's a very good question, actually. It's not one I've actually thought of before. But I have to say... That a lot of the, the postgraduate orthodontic programs out there, I suppose they're maybe more traditional in the way that they would approach the, the planning of cases where it's very much study models on a bench, <laughs> if I'm perfectly honest. And it's, it's not difficult. Well, it might be difficult for some, but for some cases, it, it can be quite difficult to get the, the smile to look good within the face. You can get the models lovely in class one. That's not a problem. You're taking teeth out, you're moving teeth around. It's just a big boy's mechano, really. You know, it's just, mm -hmm. it's just uh, pulling teeth here, there and everywhere. But it's actually getting it to look good within the face. And that can depend on the, the canting, the sagittal cant, if there's a transverse cant, how much incisal display they have, you know, things like that. You're looking at all the planes of space to fit those models in that nice class one occlusion, ideally. <laughs> so it's safe so to then, say that while, whilst people were doing their study models planning, you were keeping that for the to pass the exams, but you were looking yeah. at the, the photos more than anything. Always, always having that facial picture there and always really just having references. You don't always have to do a full smile design, but as long as you know your references, your starting points, you can work from there. But I like to, to work in a way that I've, I'm, try, I'm gathering all the diagnostic information I can uh, and, and then kind of using that when I'm formulating a plan. And I suppose that okay, so, then leads very well, I was going to say, into the third rule, which is... But I just want to summarise for those, for those listening so far. So, so I just want to summarise. Rule one was uh, begin with the uh, upper incisal edges and plan from there. Uh, and yeah. then rule two was nail your diagnosis. Absolutely. What, the, yeah. All the W's and H's to, f to yeah. figure out the story and then to help you forward. So that's where we're up to so far. So hit us Absolutely. with rule three, yeah. my friend. 
So rule three, really, and it's one that I kind of follow every single day, and it's uh, been taught to me by a, a dentist called Dr. Miguel Stanley, um, I'm sure you've heard of mm-hmm. before over in America. Yes, Cristiano um, Ronaldo's dentist. <laughs> I think so, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. And he, he really kind of uh, hit home to me. It was about giving ideal a chance. And what that means is that every patient that comes in the front door, you know, they have come to you for a, a diagnosis. They've come to you for a, a way of presenting to them what is the best thing for them. They might come in saying, Josh, my upper right central incisor is rotated. That's all I want to treat. But I, I, I don't ignore that. Don't get me wrong. But I, I kind of put that to one side because I would still take the same records, photographs, scans, x-rays, maybe even a cone beam CT if it needed it. And I would treat that patient, you know, as if they've asked me, Josh, what can I do here? Time and money or no object? What would you love to do? Because just because they've come in asking for an upper central incisor rotated doesn't excuse the fact they might have quite bad wear in their teeth, their canines have worn down, their gums aren't in the best condition. You know, we've got a duty of care for the patients. And and the way I do treatment very much is that we give Ideal a chance and we work back from there. So it might involve a lot of work. It might involve doing orthodontics. It might involve some porcelain work or composite work. It might involve very heavy work with the periodontal specialist if there's any problems. Um, it might even involve orthognathic surgery because they have a sk- underlying skeletal problem. But it's important that the, the patient is aware of all that could be and then working back from there. You know, it's, there's absolutely no harm in doing compromising uh, for your treatment as long as the patient is aware that you know, that is the, the gold standard of what we could have in an ideal world. And we can work back from there. So for me, rule three is giving ideal a chance. I, I love that rule, Josh. I mean, rule one is so fundamental. And when I started to actually look at smiles, rule two is, is great in terms of making sure we get the bigger picture. But rule yep. three, in terms of a, a real communication skill mm-hmm. to have with your patients, because put it this way, if you never present the ideal, you never get to do the ideal. If you never present exactly. comprehensive, yeah. guess what? You never get to do comprehensive. So that's such a, a, a key one. And uh, recently I was at a lecture uh, by Lincoln Harris, who, who came over to London oh, and yeah. did an amazing like performance. It was a, an actual uh, performance. He was a, one of the best performances of his because I've seen him live before, but he was just on fire. Uh, and it reminded me of, of a great thing he taught that day is that he, he says to patients, and I'm definitely you know, going to use this with my patients, is I'm going to present you the ideal plan. Mm-hmm. If, if it's too expensive, and, we can, and he says you can use the word expensive, it's okay, don't be, don't be shy. Yeah, yeah. If it's too expensive, let me know. We can make some compromises and find a, a solution that best suits yeah. you overall. But I'm going to still plan ideally because everyone deserves ideal. So I'm well, going to plan ideally, right, yeah. but if it's too expensive, let me know. I have other options. And that gives you the license. Yeah, it really does. And I suppose compromises can be in materials. It can be in accepting certain things of a malocclusion. For instance, an overjet. Like a slightly a increased, I was just going to say overjet, yeah, perfect. Like that, or a crossbite that you might not want to try and uh, treat. And there might be limitations, and it might be that surgery is the only option. I'm sure we've mm-hmm. seen, uh, I think I, I saw in your stories recently that I think it was your was it your oldest son had his adenoids taken out yep. recently. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, we get patients that unfortunately don't get that done. And then they have, you know, skeletal problems that manifest throughout their adult life narrowing of the upper jaw for example and they want they come in asking for a wider smile and it's something that orthodontics alone is something that we can't give them because we've been moving those teeth out the bone and so really their options are you know accepting the fact that orthodontically that's where the teeth have to be or restoratively it can be a bit wider you know we can add veneers composite to widen the teeth uh, artificially as such or they're moving the bones you know they're moving the their surgical expansion i wouldn't i wouldn't dream anyone or wish anyone to have it but certainly it is an option and these are the things that, that it's, it's important that anyone who's providing orthodontics really in my opinion knows about you know always plan towards the ideal and you can always compromise from there as long as the patient is aware of what these compromises mean long term Mm-hmm. And medically, legally, that it just makes sense to write well, your notes in that way as well, so yeah. that they know uh, exactly what the ideal was. And sometimes, you know, as I say, treat children idealistically, tr- treat adults realistically. That's a, a mantra drilled into me. But it doesn't mean that we can't present the ideal plan to adults. Absolutely, yeah. The good thing is, you know, in a lot, a lot of the patients I treat are kind of younger teenagers, and I guess they come with a bit less baggage in the sense that they normally have really nice shapes of teeth, unworn you know, good, good oral hygiene, ideally. Uh, and, and really, it's a case of really just moving the teeth, you know, to, to where their face is asking. But adults, as, as you know, they come with some more problems, gum problems, wear, uh, missing teeth, things like that. So there's a lot more to plan. And I have to say that I, I, I have no problems with saying to my patients, I don't know. Because in reality, you know, 
you were thrown with so much information in a first consultation situation that you can certainly let the patients know, you know, what a rough idea could be. I think your teeth are out of position. Maybe we can think about some orthodontics here. I think the shape of your teeth could be adjusted, maybe even the color adjusted here. So if you've got a couple of ideas, you're planting the seed. But I'm not mm. always telling the patient at day one that we need to do this, this and this. You know, you say, I don't know yet. The honest answer is I'm going to invite you back. We're going to gather some more information and I'm going to get you back in and we're going to present a couple of options for you. You know, and if mm -hmm. one of those options fits your your budget and fits what you're wanting, then great, we can go ahead. Brilliant. And, and I suppose the, the fourth kind of rule, bring me right into that really nicely there, is simulations. Because during a second consultation appointment, simulating the treatment uh, plan for the patient and really allowing them to visualize it before they begin it is crucial, in my opinion. And that can be as simple as doing an orthodontic setup, such as an aligner setup to show the patient the beginning and end result of what orthodontics can be. Different aligner companies have got different softwares and stuff. So that's what you mean by the simulation, right? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So the Sure Smile Aligners, which is the the company that I have been working with for a very long time, and I'm really you know enjoying using the software and really enjoying using the aligners, as I'm sure we'll talk about it later on as well. I can even share my screen and show you, um, you know, mm -hmm, what the mm -hmm. software where it looks like. So we've got an example here. And just describe for those listening in the car, driving on the train, chopping onions, etc. Just also describe uh, <laughs> what, what we're seeing here. As well. So what we're seeing here is an orthodontic simulation. It's showing us the plan from the start to the finish of where the teeth need to move to, start and then the finish. And what we're also getting here is the staging here. So the stage models of going from day one or aligner one all the way up to, in this case, aligner number 28. It's showing us where mm -hmm. the attachments need to go to provide that extra grip to the teeth that need it, as well as any space creation by the form of any IPR or interproximal reduction. It's between the teeth that allows us to get the room to align the teeth. It's showing us when that's being performed and at what stage it's being performed. And so this is something which I use a lot to, to just demonstrate to patients just how their treatment will play out from start to finish. And so they get that kind of crystal ball moment of, of what yeah. their treatment will look like once they're done. I mean, this is this is brilliant, but the Josh, there's a, another Alina company that, that I use at the moment, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, they are very well known, uh, and they have their own version of software. Uh, and I want I want to know from you, someone who's used both systems, uh, is there anything? different or, or um, interesting yeah. about uh, the short smile software? Because I heard yesterday at the Congress that something about the envelope of function uh, outlines, is, is, they, they will show you the cross section of the envelope function? It does indeed. So uh, this software is, is really the most powerful software I've ever seen. <laughs> it's, it's got so much in it. And the, uh -huh. the, one of the biggest things for me are the quality control tools. So these are the tools that allow you to see the contact points, tooth widths, the, the marginal ridges, tooth axis and things as well, as well wow. as being able to actually kind of see and measure, uh, you know, between the teeth. Uh, let me get the kind of measuring tool here. You can kind of clip the frame as well so you can see the envelope of function right there. You can then move between the teeth yeah. to see where the contact points are. It is really quite sometimes daunting, I'm not going to lie. The amount of buttons, yeah. <laughs> but to be honest with you, you know, it's you can use it for as much or as little uh, as you want, yeah. really. You, you get out it. what you want, what you put in. So if you want to see all that exactly. extra detail, you can reveal it if you want to. But if you want to do the usual stuff, you can do that as well. I can, I can see that. I mean, the, the software really came from traditional orthodontic planning with brackets and wires, and it's really kind of developed from there. And so there is so much uh, diagnostic information that can be, you know, at your fingertips here, uh, as well as really looking really closely into your cases to to look at where they come from and where you want to get to, um, and that's mm -hmm. you know that's just the software. That's not even talking about the actual aligners themselves. So yeah, you mm -hmm. can see I'm passionate about it because uh, I honestly <laughs> don't know why more people aren't using it because <laughs> it's like wow. But, okay, well uh, let, let, let's let's talk about that, Josh. So, so you know, rule rule one was incisal edge. Rule two was uh, ask uh, the questions get the diagnoses, all the W's and H. Uh, rule three, which I love, was um, give ideal a chance. And rule mm -hmm. four was um, uh, the rule of aesthetic planning is use okay. simulation, which just makes so much sense to, to your patient and also to you as you're planning the case. Oh my God, you just overlaid the face over it. This is awesome. Okay, so so this, yeah. this is cool. So um, that makes complete sense. Now I'll let you just tell me any other things you want to tell me about rule four before we then talk about uh, short smile and why perhaps you're using short smile and not some of the other competitor aligners out there. Yeah, I mean, for for me, really, as I told you in rule one, you know, it starts with the face, it starts with the smile design and, and really with the software, you can overlay the exact teeth 
both the starting model and the end model, you know, into the patient's face. You can see kind of what it's going to look like in the end, like a try before you buy. You mm -hmm. wouldn't buy a car where they're taking it for a test drive first, and it's exactly the same. So this mm -hmm. is really the, the simplest version of the simulation where you can just show the patient what it would look like. You know, it's a little bit of a cartoon here because obviously the teeth are your scans that you've taken in, in the mouth. But it really does give the patient a really nice idea of what it will look like. And sorry to stop you, Josh. You said scan, so I have to ask you this, right? So okay. with certain aligner companies, you have to get a certain scanner to, to send. So would I need it's a dense ply? So I would, have, I would have to have a prime scan to send to get sure smile aligners? No, you don't, actually. The, the sure smile aligner system is very much an open access platform. It accepts scans from any brand of scanner that's out there. Um, okay. and, and that's partly the reason why I really like working with Densupply is that they have always been and always will be uh, an open access software where you're not limited by a brand. As well as that, you can also export things. So without jumping too far ahead here, you know, it really does give you, you know, the, the freedom and the versatility to ask for all of your aligners to be made. Um, and that's by SureSmile itself, um, which comes in a very nice kind of branded packaging, just like you would with other aligner brands as well, the patients will recognize. But it does also allow you to export. So if you have a local dental lab or you have a lab in-house, you can ask for them to print the models for you, for you to make your aligners. Or even if you want to do everything, you know, yourself, you could export each SDL file or each scan wow. file of every stage or every aligner in that treatment, and you can make them yourself. So it's a bit like, wow. I've described this in the past, a bit like going into a restaurant. You know, you can go in and you can order from the set menu, which is like what you would do with other aligner brands where you're limited to maybe 12 or four, you know, 24 aligners, you know, or you can have as many aligners as you want. You can eat as much as you want in the buffet. <laughs> or, you know, you can choose from the a la carte menu. You can decide you don't want a starter today, but you will want a main and a dessert. And that's fine. So you can export the STL files and make the liners yourself. Or if you really want to go to town, you can even go walk into the kitchen and you can make your own food. You know, you could actually <laughs> go in there. You're not relying on a technician if you really want to. And I would say and stress that I keep this myself for more milder cases where I can take control and be my own technician, where mm -hmm. I can actually move the teeth myself, plan the movements which the software allows, and then actually export or ask SureSmell to make my liners for me. So there well, what is What would no... be the benefit to you, Josh? Why would you do that step of making it in-house? Is it ultimately a, a financial benefit of you cooking in-house compared to eating out? It is really the financial benefit, <laughs> but also for okay. the patient. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm not having to pay for the chef. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 But, but uh, that, that's really good that, that the Densply and SureSmell allow you to. That I'm kind of surprised in a way and, and shocked, and it's pretty impressive that they're, is, they're just yeah. pretty open with that. That's that's to be admired, I, I guess. I, I guess you can use it for as much or as little as you wish, just like the, the quality control tools and the diagnostic tools in the sense that uh, if you do have a more mild case, perhaps just a, a relapse, the patient has lost the retainer for a few weeks and they said, ah, oh, my tooth has moved a little bit. You know, you could literally take a, a scan of the mouth upload it, move that tooth back. It will tell you just how many stages you might need. And then, you know, you make those aligners and it saves the cost for you, saves the cost for the patient. Everyone wins. Is that something that um, you get taught by Sure Smile? Because I guess there are lots of courses teaching you how to do your own yeah. aligners, orthodontic base. So does Sure Smile actually uh, teach you the methods involved that, hey, if you want to come to the kitchen, cook yourself, well, you know, here's your utensils. Like, how does it work? The main focus for Sure Smile, you know, as a mentor and as a teacher myself, really, it is using the software and it is about kind of using the technicians, communicating with the technicians for more complex cases or cases that you want the help, basically. But it, it, it allows you to open the doors to do that yourself. And that is something that over the years I have I have learned myself. You know, I haven't had much guidance other than some of my peers. But and, and in a sense, there is an element of trial and error here as well. You know, you are moving the tooth. My, mild movements, I would say. I wouldn't tackle anything above, say, uh, eight or ten aligners mm -hmm. uh, myself. But certainly mm -hmm. the more But with their full package, the yeah. But with, the, with their full package, you can do elastic tads like the, the, the full whack? Absolutely, yeah. There is no limitation. Again, you can add elastics if you need to. In fact, I've just listened to your your one of the podcasts from uh, Straight Pro actually about elastics, and I was a bit mm -hmm. kind of like, oh wow, don't use them. <laughs> I, do, I do, I do, and I don't. I have to say, and I'm glad yeah. I listened to that lecture because it kind of or the podcast sorry because it really did uh, kind of uh, confirm that I'm doing things okay. <laughs> you know, I'm Good not man. doing it for the sake of it. I'm doing it because I'm moving individual teeth. Uh, and yeah, you know, if you want, and it allows you to be creative. You can add bite ramps if you want to yourself. Um, you can actually ask for a variable trim height. Now, this is one of the most underrated things in aligners at the moment, is asking mm -hmm. for a variable trim height. 
So I mean? first explain what that actually, yeah, what yeah. You, you were just about to do that, I'm sorry. But also, yeah. like, why, well, I want to know when you would ask for a lower trim height, height because I've seen Tiff talk about this. Uh, yeah, and yeah. I'm like, firstly, okay, it's pretty cool how you can customize something. But I, I, at the moment, with my lack of knowledge, right. I wouldn't know when to prescribe which one and what benefits yeah. would you get. So t tell us, teach us, enlighten us. So, yeah, as you said, I actually, again, just listened to a podcast that Tiff did. I think it was the Teeth and Tails podcast um, that, that's just gone on recently, actually. And he described this perfectly, actually. So I'm probably going to repeat a little bit what he said, if I'm honest. And that is that with a scalloped trim line, like you might be more accustomed to using some other brands of aligners, that has a degree of flexibility. Okay, for correcting rotated teeth, for example, where you want the plastic to be able to bend and almost stretch into an embrasure or into an area where that's the, the plastic is quite difficult to reach. Because with aligners, you've got to think like the plastic. How does that tooth or aligner grip that tooth, you know? I think I, I also uh, liked the analogy on one of the podcasts I listened to recently where it's like a slippery watermelon seed. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> like a lat for lateral incisors, like slippery watermelon seeds. That's it. And, uh, and yeah, you know, a more flexible aligner uh, trim height, like the skeleton might for rotations but also uh, being aware that the higher up or the the more rigid the tray is so if you're asking for a straight trim line more associated with something like a retainer for example that becomes a lot more rigid and so if the patient is needing a lot of attachments because of control you want know, to keep more control over certain tooth movements then again, you might choose a scallop trim line because you want that flexibility so the patient can comfortably get it in and out. <laughs> and I have been caught out in the past where I thought, yeah, all the attachments, really high trim line, and the patient goes, and you're like, oh, wow, that ain't coming out easy. So yeah, it's a degree that, you know, it's a bit of a learning curve as well when you start with this other option, essentially, that you maybe haven't had the, uh, the chance to use before. So, but, so, so if you go for a higher trim line, i.e. Um, straight, so not scallop, straight, that means that you need to use less attachments? Did I get that right? Yeah, you're spot on. So with a more rigid tray, because this, the um, aligner is trimmed a bit higher, it, you can apply, I suppose, slightly heavier forces to the teeth, just ever so slightly. Um, and it does mean you get more control, you know, so um, it will mean less attachments, which is amazing because patients generally request aligner treatment for the discrete nature of the treatment. And so when you can offer the patient a higher trim line, which keeps the plastic above the smile line, so they don't actually see any of the plastic at all, uh, or the edge of the plastic, I should say, which mm -hmm. is something very visible. And you're having less attachments because attachments are they reflect the light at different angles and they can be very visible and, and one of the things which uh, was one of the main reasons why I moved away from other aligner brands and you know years and years ago was because actually during that fitting appointment where you you hand the patient the mirror and say here is your first aligner you know I used to dread that because the honest truth was it didn't look good you know the, the aligners weren't maybe as clear as they were hoping for uh, and also there was a lot of attachments which just drew away from that discrete nature and so now mm -hmm. it is a complete rever reversal whereby, you know, I, I, I'm looking forward to giving the patient the, the mirror and saying, look how clear these are, uh, the, the mm -hmm. actual aligner mm -hmm. material themselves, uh, and look how, you know, discreet this can be for you. So, you know, there's, this is a topic I speak a lot on and, and it's fantastic. I'm hoping I'm I'm bringing forward my uh, my enthusiasm for it. <laughs> Absolutely, no, it, sh it shines through. Now, do I need to to spend a, a best part of uh, four thousand pounds to 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 learn how to give <laughs> these <Yeah>. aligners? <laughs> no, not at all. No, it's, it's not, maybe not my uh, my area to say. But certainly, uh, if you were keen to get involved with another aligner brand as such, you know, mm -hmm. I'd always mm -hmm. say don't uh, put all your eggs in one basket. You know look around and see what other options are available. And SureSmile being one of the major competitors in the aligner market at the moment. And if you wanted to start using SureSmile, it's a case of reaching out to one of the representatives, uh, going on the website and expressing your interest. Um, there isn't so much a, a course that you would pay to go on as such that you're almost uh, paying to have access to the software because it is such a powerful software. And with that access then comes the case for you to do for your first case for free. So really, uh, there's an investment to make to, to start using SureSmile. But if you mm. do your first case, it balances out. So that's really okay. the best way I can describe it. Brilliant, brilliant. So you obviously uh, teach uh, for sure, Smile. Uh, are yeah. you also like a mentor, like on the end of a phone, uh, if someone needs advice in planning a case? Or how does? It, well, I guess that my next question is how how does support lend itself to yeah. the system? So at the moment, um, Sure Smile and the IS Academy, 
uh, myself and Tiff and Ross Hobson and, and many other mentors that are out there. I can't name them all. Um, we we actually have a, a kind of a handshake agreement, I suppose, with uh, Dent Supply and, and Sure Smile to provide a lot of the teaching and also the mentoring. So oh, if wow. there are cases that you would like to ask questions, upload photographs, get any um, help with, then there are many mentors all over the world to help with that. There is also the, the the communication kind of customer support line as well for simple, more software related things as well. So there will be an answer to your question somewhere. So is this sure. on like the IAS website where you got like the it forum indeed, and yeah. stuff? Oh, that's brilliant. So, I mean, exactly. having used that in the past, um, I, I can definitely vouch for that. Uh, you know, I have so much faith in IAS, TIFF, PRAV, yeah. PROF. Uh, so some some great people there. So uh, IAS yeah. is very trustworthy. So that, that, that that's Absolutely, a really good thing yeah. to, to have. So that, that's, uh, that's amazing. You know, and you can, again, use as much or a little of the, the um, support network that there as you wish you know even things like whatsapp group chats if you just want a quick answer to a question as well you know we're trying to keep it in the 21st century and keep everyone kind of in contact with one another <laughs> very cool well joshua uh, you've answered my main thing about the four key rules in planning aesthetic dentistry and it's great coming from you so passionate about ortho restorative and uh, i'm sure you'll agree that the best orthodontics might be done with from someone who's got a restorative eye uh, a, a, yeah, as you do and I, and I truly believe that so it's great to learn these pearls from you and thanks for sharing some extra bits about why other aligner companies Companies might do things differently and what benefits that may present. So, um, you know, shout out to, to Sure Smile for, for that. Yeah. And, and so it's great to learn about that. And I trust people like you. Uh, and Tiff, Tiff is a, is a huge inspiration in, in, in my career and, and I know yours as well. So uh, a hat tip to, to Tiff as well. Uh, Josh, tell us how we can follow you and find out more from you on, on social media and also any courses that you run, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I, I wish I was better at social media, if I'm honest with you. I just It's a matter of time. It really is. <laughs> How much time can you afford? I, I, I'm a busy man. What can I say? You know, treating, treating patients, doing what I enjoy doing the most, which is actually achieving these smiles that, that we do. But yeah, f- happy for anyone to contact me uh, via social media, things like that. If you want to, I'm on Instagram and Facebook. I would strongly encourage you know anyone who's listening today to, if you have any questions, just to reach out to me. And yeah, you know, f- see what's out there. I would say to any any young dentist or, or dentist who's really wanting to get into this kind of work, whether it's with orthodontics or, or smile design, you know, do, do your research, you know, see what courses might be out there. I don't particularly run um, any courses myself. I, I do a lot of the teaching through Sure Smile and through IS Academy. So again, you know, seek these courses out if you want to learn more. And there is so much with aligners, you know, it's, it's not something that can be taught in a day. You know, like when you go on a course, uh, you know, in a hotel room for one day, yes, they can teach you how to do the fundamentals, which is your IPR, your polishing between your teeth. You can teach you how to put attachments on, but there is it's it's that black box I was talking about before that really you know separates the you know how to do it, but how to really can understand it really. It's like passion driving test. You don't really know how to drive when you pass your driving test, <laughs> do you? Absolutely no. You always learn afterwards, and I said the same thing about about BDS. And uh, it's great to have mentorship, which is a recurring theme of the podcast. Hence why uh, I, you know I was able yeah. to to lean on your knowledge as a mentor uh, a few years back uh, on a case. So thank you again, Josh, for for helping me out that time, and again helping me out this time to to, to yeah. help these dentists uh, better plan their aesthetics. And just you know that rule one is just so key in knowing where to begin. And I really, really love that rule three. You know that, that communication yeah. one. So th- those are my two of the my favorite of the four. But I think you gave great value there. So Josh, thank you so much for, for spending time with us today. No, thank you very much, Jazz. Thanks for everyone who was listening. And yeah, everyone enjoy the rest of your weekend. <laughs> So there we have it, guys. As a summary, rule number one that I said right at the beginning is to start with the upper incisal edges. Once you plan where the upper incisal edge will go in the face and your or the proposed future position of that central incisor, then everything else falls into place. Uh, That rule two was to find out what the diagnosis is. Diagnose, diagnose, diagnose. The why, the what, the how. Where do you want the different teeth to be? So the example I gave was whether you should lengthen the teeth or in that specific patient, would you get a better result in the face by crown lengthening. Another example would be if someone's width proportions of their teeth, like got really small lateral incisors, that's really important as part of your diagnosis. So diagnose in every way possible so you can get a better treatment plan because the diagnosis always informs your treatment plan. Rule number three was my personal favorite. Give ideal a chance. Give the ideal treatment plan a chance. Communicate it with your patient. Yes, you can make compromises. It is not a sin. It is not dirty to compromise. But if you are compromising, the patient should know there's a compromise being made. It really helps with your consent. And number four, 
for simulations. So if you are using Aligner Therapy, then you can use the software of your Aligner company. Yeah, sure, smile, look very, very snazzy. So thanks to Josh for sharing a screen share. But those who are listening were able to follow along in terms of what makes this software unique. And if you've watched or if you've listened on the Protrusive Premium app, you can now answer the simple questions to claim your CPD for this episode, which is really quick and easy. Within 72 hours, we send you a certificate with your reflective log inside as well. One of the example questions for this episode uh, is, what are the two main photos used for deciding the central incisor position? Is it A, the D and N smile? Is it B, the E and N smile? Is it C, the E and M smile? Or is it D, the D and M smiles? So if you know the answer to that one and the other ones, why don't you join Petrusa Premium, answer a few questions, and get rewarded for your CPD hour for listening to the entire way and also validate your learning and reflect on it. This is going to be really good at the end of the year to have all your reflections and the lessons you learn from Protrusive in one place. So if you've got a few minutes, get on the app and just answer those questions and you're well on your way to getting CPD. Anyway, I'll catch you in the next episode. Same time, same place. Thank you for listening all the way to the end.